Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Athenaeum Theatre. I'm Michael Williams, director of the Wheeler Centre, and I'd ask you to join me in a big round of applause for the Wheeler Centre hitting its fifth birthday. We are pretty excited, and tonight's event is the first in three gala events we're doing to kick off our birthday year and then follow it with hundreds of others that we're very excited about. Uh, this first of our three galas uh, tackles the part of the Wheeler Centre brief that is ideas. We're very proud to be a literary organisation in a literary city, um, but being a centre for books, writing and ideas means that we can take as our subjects just about anything we damn well please. And the discussion of ideas is something that we derive a great deal of pleasure from. Uh, we wanted to hold a debate, but we didn't want to reduce everything to false binaries. We felt that we are nuanced people, all of us, and we contain multitudes. And so we have six of the best thinkers in Australia today on the stage, five of them who will be feverishly arguing with themselves, and uh, the host that we most wanted for this event, the only person we asked, and we're very lucky to have her on a day when arguably she may have had a little bit else on. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming the wonderful Annabelle Crabb. <laughs> and you thought I wasn't going to make it. I spent 12 hours today uh, in the studio in there. It was nearly adult nappy territory, let me tell you. But it all ended up happily, of course. And can I say, first of all, thank you, Michael. Thank you to you all for being here. And um, I cannot explain how delighted I am to be at a proper gala debate. See, I've spent most of today monitoring a gala debate, and um, this one already seems a lot more productive. Now, Not that we are here without a purpose. We are here uh, to explore a profound purpose, that is to explore Australia's immediate future. We're not getting too crazy here. We're not uh, toying with anything incredibly futuristic like hoverboards or jetpacks or Malbruff prime ministerships or, you know, <laughs> Richmond premierships. Uh, we are looking at our destiny, ladies and gentlemen, tonight straight in the eye, uh, trying to imagine what things will be like five years away in the year 2020. Now, try to imagine what that will be like is a lot harder and a more interesting challenge than you may think. It requires flexible minds and clear thinking. It requires walking and chewing gum at the same time. So to help us navigate this challenge, we've invited some of the brightest minds in the business to debate whether we should feel optimistic or pessimistic about our next five years. We've already polled you, some of you will have noticed that, as you walk through the door to establish your own, the state of optimism or pessimism in this room. I'm gonna be bringing those results to you very soon. We do have some early figures from the Liberal Party room uh, <laughs> indicating that the <laughs> pessimism to optimism ratio was roughly 39 to 61 <laughs> cent. We'll, uh, We'll be going to Anthony Green for better figures later on. Uh, but I did mention great brains, and I have five of them to introduce quickly to you now, and I will introduce them much more lavishly in a moment. They are Eva Cox, George Megalogenis, Simon Overland, Marita Cheng, Gregory Phillips. Applaud them all. They look broodingly intelligent. Now, um, you know, Michael's already intimated that this debate format, proposed, invented, and road-tested tonight by the Wheeler Centre, is completely original. It's a bit radical and unique. Uh, in the old terms, what's going to happen is that each speaker is going to argue both for the affirmative and the negative, <laughs> one after the other. Uh, unusual, I know. But 
we decided on this format because we think that smart people can usually see both sides of the argument. They know that intelligent public discourse doesn't reduce complex matters to binaries. And when you think about some of the most challenging issues we as a society are currently facing, climate change, migration against borders, tension in the Middle East, there are often more than two sides to these stories. Plus, it is fun to watch people arguing with themselves in public. We know that from today, right? So. It's very current, ladies and gentlemen. So, here's how it's going to work. We're going to hear arguments for the optimist, optimistic and pessimistic future of Australia from each speaker on a given area. I will be keeping them to time very strictly with this bell. <laughs> they will have four minutes each uh, for each side of their argument. Following that, I will be using the best submissions made to the Wheeler Centre over the past few days, using the miracle of technology, to pose a range of questions to our panel. These pes this questions will be posed either to the pessimistic self of the speaker or the optimistic self of the speaker. And perhaps after that, they might argue between themselves. It's going to be an awful lot of fun. And um, we're going to finish off with a, fi a pi final poll of the panel and of you to determine a winner or more reasonably, I suppose, a position on Australia's march towards 2020. But before we go any further, I am going to reveal the results of our pre-event polling. I was handed the envelope uh, a moment ago by Seb, our returning officer, and uh, it turns out that when asked whether you feel optimistic or pessimistic about Australia's immediate future toward 2020, 300 and... 10 of you, I can't remember my own writing, that's a good start, isn't it? 310 people were polled, 239 are feeling optimistic, and 79 pessimistic. And one of you voted for Malcolm Turnbull, but that doesn't count. <laughs> um, so that's 75-25. That's pretty optimistic. Let's see if we can't drag that mood down tonight. All right. Now, we're going to crack on because... We've got a lot to talk about. Our first speaker is Gregory Phillips. Greg is from the Wanyi and Jaru pe peoples and comes from Cloncurry and Mount Isa. He is a medical anthropologist, currently completing his PhD in psychology on Aboriginal health, cultural safety and medical education. He's written a national Indigenous health workforce strategy and published a book on addictions and healing in Aboriginal country. Please welcome speaking first optimistically and then pessimistically on matters of Indigenous affairs and health. Greg Phillips, welcome. I thank Bunjal Look Eagle, creator of the Kulin Nation, Lands and Peoples. The two major issues confronting Australia are national identity and sustainability. And Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples are essential to addressing both. Let me take an optimistic view of national identity. We will embark on a national peacemaking project. First, we will establish a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We must do more than admit past mistakes and say sorry. We will admit that genocide occurred here and that it still affects us today. We will do this because it is a psychological shadow that will stay with us until confronted. Second, we will atone for these mistakes, including make sure the national curriculum and galleries memorialise and ensure these things never happen again. We will make it illegal to deny genocide, like they do in Germany, and we, like we do by remembering Gallipoli. We will make reparations, both financial and social. Third, we will discuss our values as a nation and make sure we balance both 60,000 years of Aboriginal knowledge and excellence in scientific, scientific and artistic endeavours. Fourth, we will negotiate power sharing between the first Australians and the Crown, such that sovereignty is shared equally, rather than power always resting in the hands of a few white men. Fifth, we will host a series of constitutional conventions, like the Founding Fathers, where all Australians will consider the rationale, values and models for what an Australian Republic could be. This will be our chance to dream big. It will be our chance to improve on the outdated Westminster and US systems of governance. We will be a beacon for social democracy, social justice, 
economic prosperity and environmental sustainability. Sixth, when we have understood our history and ourselves far better than at present, we will decide on a new constitution, a new flag and a new model for governance. Then we will become a republic. We will be proud of the oldest living culture in the world as our collective heritage, ensuring Aboriginal people are front and centre of power sharing and governance, while continuing to honour and revere Queen Elizabeth and her family's history and traditions. Newer Australians will be respected for their cultural differences rather than attacked. On sustainability, we will enact a renewable energy target, a clean energy fund and reinstate the Climate Council. We will invest heavily in the CSIRO and medical and scientific research and the arts. We will invest heavily in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander languages, knowledges and cultures, not out of charity, but because these hold the seeds to our collective survival. We will invest heavily in solar and wind power and be a world leader at it, making sure no more of our scientific inventions succumb to the brain drain or to industry's lies. We will work with industry to make the transition to new world realities. Now, since sustainability is also economic in nature, we will ensure expenditure review committees include citizen participation so that we have a say in where our dollars are spent. We will ban corporate and union donations to political parties over $1,000. And we will wind down negative gearing because more than one or two house per family is greedy and unsustainable. We will ensure that press freedoms are balanced with enforceable press standards. We will enshrine a federal ICAC. And since sustainability is also social, we'll invest heavily in social programs so that our young people do not try to self-initiate themselves into adulthood on the drunken beaches of schoolies week. They will find connection, meaning and their life path in spiritual, not religious forms of social connectedness. Together, these two areas for reform, national identity and sustainability, are about a more effective partnership between the people and the land. These reforms will ensure citizens participate in the Republic with passion and respect for each other, and that we survive and thrive. Thank you, Anna Bell. <laughs> shifting lecterns. Oh, you'll notice that Greg's now symbolically shifting lecterns. That will happen when the mood changes in these And I will talk in my lower voice. <laughs> no, I won't. Um, national identity. Look, Australia as a country is sorely lacking in vision at the moment. Our geographic isolation, obsession with Eurocentrism, fear of the other and of the future, and a belief that real estate and money can take away any of life's pains will continue and will get worse. We will continue to psychologically ring fence ourselves in, staying small in vision and full of fear and hatred. As a result, we will become more ashamed of our history, stronger deniers of it, more racist and more violent in politics, society and family. We will continue to alienate our neighbours and treat refugees as dogs to be killed slowly. We will continue to deny we have a national problem with alcohol and drugs, suicide and violence, preferring instead to believe that the lie that only Aboriginal people have them. We will continue to let the corporates make us believe only shopping and buying houses can save us. We will continue to overly rely on sport as a national obsession because we feel deeply psychologically unresolved or fearful of everything else. <laughs> we will continue to enforce the Northern Territory intervention where Aboriginal people themselves and poorer whites elsewhere are regarded as the problem. We will address alcohol, drugs and violence as an individual punitive issue rather than as a societal and systemic health issue. Our jails, courts and emergency departments will get more overcrowded. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders will continue to be marginalised, attacked and blamed or included only on terms that make others feel charitable or where Aboriginal knowledge can be exploited for economic gain. In terms of sustainability, Corporates, banks and multinationals will continue to avoid taxes and make obscene profits while buying political favour. Political leadership will continue to be a media popularity contest, a Miss Universe for wannabe Bon Jovis. Citizens will become increasingly angry and alienated from the political system and we will hunker down in individualistic fears and an each man for themselves mentality. 
mental health and social dislocation will continue to rise and health will continue to be seen as a commodity, not a right. The Trans-Pacific Partnership will ensure less protection for the land and for industry and more profits for the banks, more suicide, more social and spiritual loss. In short, without radical social, political and economic transformation, the relationship between our land and our people will continue to deteriorate. Only the rich will get richer. And yet suicide, violence, obesity and cancer will increase for everyone. With peacemaking and transformation, however, we will make good on what Professor Eric Wilmot, Australia's first Aboriginal professor, called the last social experiment. He prophesied that while all other continents have trialled and failed in peacemaking and race relations, and that Australia, being both the oldest and youngest continent, may be the last society on earth with a chance to get it right. On current form, we're failing, but all hope is not lost. When someone asks me why I thought white people came to Australia and why they did what they did to Aboriginal peoples back then and why we're still living with the results of that, I told them that whites were rejected by their own and treated cruelly and that perhaps they came here to find the meaning of love. Aboriginal people's spirituality holds the key to human survival through peacemaking and sustainability. We're ready to share it. Are you ready to receive it? Thanks. So, Greg, at about the 80% mark of your second address there, I could feel the 75% really <laughs> dipping away. But you brought it back at the end there, didn't you? That was cheeky. <laughs> yeah, all right. Nevertheless, we will more than uh, gratefully accept that contribution. Thank you, Greg. Um, Marita Cheng is our next speaker uh, and part-time op optimist and part-time pessimist. Marita founded RoboGals Global in 2008 as a response to the traditionally low levels of participation by women in engineering and technology. In 2012, she was named Young Australian of the Year. Speaking optimistically and pessimistically on robots and artificial intelligence in five years, please welcome Marita Cheng. I'm going to start pessimistically so that we end on a high because I'm, I'm a bit younger than the others and um, I hope that the future is bright. <laughs> so about 10 years ago when I was about 15, I was, <laughs> I was playing in the gardens and I thought, what, what do I want to do when I'm older? And I thought, you know, we have these computers and I can go on the internet and find all this information, and it's amazing. But why can't I do the same thing? Why can't I use computers and make things move in the real world? Why can't I make mechanical objects move around? Why can't I make robotic arms move around to wash the dishes for me or clean the floor for me or do all the chores that my mum wants me to do, which I did anyway? And as a pessimistic argument for tonight, I'd like to argue that in another 10 years' time, the future will be just as bleak. 10 years ago, I thought, why aren't there robots here? 10 years later, there are still no robots in our homes doing the chores. And in 10 years, why should anything be different? Melbourne, like the rest of the world, is facing an ageing population into the future. Between 2000 and 2050, the, propor the proportion of the world's population over 60 years will double from about 11% to 22%. The lack of carers in Australia is a huge problem. For example, Australia faces a shortage of more than 150,000 paid and unpaid carers for people with dementia by 2029. How are we going to care for our elders? Who is going to care for us? In short, we need robots in our lives. Japan, which is facing an even greater increase in population numbers than Melbourne, has already acknowledged that 
and began creating robots long ago. But their robots look like humans and sound like humans. They have motors inside that make them move a little bit so that when you look at it, a robot from afar that looks like a human, it's not just an inanimate object, it's actually moving from the motors and when you touch it, you can feel the heat of the motors. But we don't just need robots that look like humans or that look good. We need robots that are functional, robots that can move around the house, forwards, backwards, rotational, and we need robots that have an arm attached so that it can be helpful. It sounds like science fiction, but these robots will exist to get our drinks, take the bins out, and get our medication. Just yesterday, I saw that an English university had created just this robot. These robots should exist in our lives. They should be here now. The problem with these robots, though, is the exorbitant price. That robot that I saw yesterday, it costs 275,000 US dollars. 275,000 US dollars. The reason for the price is the robotic arm. I built a few robot arms. It's pretty hard. So I'm going to tell you about a few problems in building robot arms. So the reason why robot arms are so hard is because if you have a robot arm in your house, you want it to be able to move smoothly so it has smooth control. You want it to be able to move slowly so that it doesn't hurt anyone. It needs to be safe around humans. But that aside, every single degree of mobility that a robot arm can move in is another actuator, and every actuator costs a lot of money. In order for a robot arm to reach any single point in space, it needs to have six actuators. And once you've sorted out the actuator problem, the robot arm requires a gripper. And then the worst problem for all roboticists is wires. So the problem with actuators is that the more you want the robot arm to lift, the bigger the actuators have to be. And the bigger the actuators are near the mass, the bigger they have to be towards the base. So they're really hard and really expensive. And um, that's my time, because I was told to be strict with time. <laughs> so yes, pessimism. Um, robot arms are very, very expensive and, and very difficult to make. But I think that people need to go through the pessimism in order to find the optimism. And in Melbourne alone, I know of two companies that are working on creating lower cost robotic arms in order to bring those fantastic robots to our lives. One of them is called Modbot. So typically, the robot, the actuators that pessimism described cost about $3,000 each. And if you need six of them in an arm, then an arm would cost about at least $18,000. So Modbot is aiming to create these actuators at a cost of $300, bringing the price of a robot arm down from $18,000 to $1,800. So the future's not that bleak. <laughs> and as well as that, um, as I mentioned, I myself have been working on robotic arms, and one of the largest issues in the assistive aid space is the lack of intuitive control interfaces to, to maneuver complex assistive aids. So there's all these cool devices that exist out there, but people can't use them in an intuitive way. And so we're doing a lot of research into controlling devices using your eyes, so you look somewhere and a robotic arm goes there, or you move your head around and a robot arm moves accordingly as well. And through this research into robotic arms, um, I'm actually working on a very low-cost price robot of that $275,000 robot. <laughs> um, and actually, you know, given this demographic, I... <laughs> no, 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 I'm acknowledging you. Um, I wouldn't be able to do it without, without my mentor. And my mentor's an 82-year-old female engineer, and she's absolutely amazing and has built over 2,000 products in her in her 60-year career. And so, you know, with people who have the knowledge 
like you guys in the audience and people who have enthusiasm and, and the want for a greater future, I encourage all of you to go out there and mentor people and share your knowledge with young people because we want to learn from you so that we can create a better future. As well as that, um, it's not just robot arms that are going to have a huge impact um, in, the, in, the next, in the next five years. Um, other exciting things that are happening include drones. So a drone is basically a, a remote controlled or autonomous flying device. And so it, it's like a plane without a pilot or like a helicopter without a pilot <laughs> or the pilots on the ground controlling it with the joystick. So the problem with drones these days is um, people are scared of them because they fall out of the sky and can severely injure people. Um, but, and there's also cause for concern that drones equipped with video cameras will fly over backyards and invade our privacy. And as they become more and more popular, our skies will be full of buzzing machines that not only create a lot of noise, but collide with each other. But, balloon, but drones also have really amazing, fun uses all throughout the world. They can be used to deliver packages to your home so that if you are sick and you can't get your groceries, you can get a drone deliver them from the grocery store to your house. They're used in search and rescue, even, even these days, basically, because there's no, there's, there aren't as many people around for a drone to crash and fall on. So in, uh, in like cliffs and in, in the search, in, in the sea, um, drones are really helpful to, to spot swimmers that are, um, aren't doing so well. Um, <laughs> um, drones can be used to monitor forest fires and environmental disasters. They can film real estates, protests, sporting events. Um, it can be used to analyse plays in a professional sport so people can see exactly where their feet go. It's early, and I just read this week that China um, are actually starting real live deliveries um, of tea bags using drones. Um, <laughs> so I think it's just a matter of time before all the kinks are ironed out by places that are really innovative like China, and then. And then once that's all done, I'm sure that Australia will accept safe drones into our lives. Watch this space. Our demographic thanks yours, Marita. <laughs> Get me a tea bag, stat. <laughs> That was excellent. Uh, George Megalogenis is our next speaker. No stranger to any of you, I suspect. Um, he is, no, that is not right. Yes, it is right. Uh, he's an author, a commentator and journalist. Really, I've known him for years. It's embarrassing that I should forget who he is. Um, he's an author, commentator and journalist with over 20 year, 27 years experience in the media and still looks so fresh, doesn't he, ladies and gentlemen? His latest book, The Australian Moment, uh, the reissued latest edition of which you can see encrusted with its gold stars and awards um, and endorsements from very sensible people. Uh, won the 2013 Prime Minister's Literary Award for Nonfiction, as well as a Walkley Award. He's a regular panellist on ABC TV's The Insiders. Speaking on reasons tonight to feel optimistic or pessimistic about Australia's economic future towards 2020, please welcome George Megalogenis. Thank you, Annabelle. And I am starting optimistically, so this is the George that will tell you why the Australian moment hasn't ended. And I'm going to bounce off Rupert Murdoch because uh, he's obviously <laughs> issued tweets today to uh, tell us all how to think about the um, state of the nation, state of the world, state of the universe, and all the other things. The first of the two tweets after the, uh, after the Liberal uh, leadership spill, LNP, obviously for his global um, readers, you need to translate that. That's not a, a form of energy. It's Liberal National Party. Gov, government, failed to tell country about dire state of economy. Gillard left manufacturing impossible, then commodities collapsed. Now, optimistic George will um, very, very quickly point out that if Julia Gillard collapsed the global price of oil, that makes her a legend. And it's actually not a bad thing for Australia to have cheaper energy prices. I thought that was the point of the exercise of uh, removing the carbon tax. Now, the... <clears throat> 
He also says an Australian government faces absolute necessity for tough change. Change could bring poison chalice. So whoever's supping from this cup apparently is going to drop dead while trying to fix the country. Now, the reason why I'm posing the question, can this moment last? Uh, because I left the question open-ended in my last book. I figured sooner or later I'm going to have to account for the question I asked. Now, optimistic George is going to tell you that uh, this moment hasn't ended yet. We are 23 years growing, still uh, growing, notwithstanding the interruptions of politics of the last few years. There isn't a country in the history of the world that has grown for 23 years without a deep recession. Now, the question looking to 2020, can we get to 30, essentially 29 years, and if we do get there by 2020, we'll be ticking over into a third, into a fourth decade of uninterrupted growth. Now, obviously, I'm an optimist, so I'm telling you it's going to happen. Not only will it happen, the slowdown we're going to have in the short term is actually going to be good for us because it'll be a shallow recession, not a deep one, and it might help to reset the political debate. Now, in the last few years, I'm going to tick off the winds. We avoided the Asian financial crisis, the tech wreck at the turn of the 21st century, and the global financial crisis. Now, the reason why I bang on about that is the most extraordinary thing that happened in that episode is that we separated from the US and the UK. Now, I'm going to leave that thought hanging for a second, but I'll just give you the unemployment rates at the peak of the GFC, i.e. when the worst of it was washing through uh, the global economy. The US unemployment rate hit 10%, the British unemployment rate hit 8%, and ours didn't cross 6 Now, that's not a bad record. Now, what I need to do now, because I've been worrying about this for a few years, is there a precedent in our history for an event like that? Now, it turns out we're in the middle of a mining boom, which everyone's aware of. The question is, has that mining boom ended? Which is essentially answers the question about whether the moment has passed or not. Now, I'm going to sit on the fence on the mining boom because they tend to be pretty choppy things. But if you look back, and the only way to look forward is to actually use history as a guide, we've had two very, very substantial commodity cycles in our history. The first one, which people may be familiar with in the history books, began with a gold rush down here. Well, it actually started in Bathurst, but the gold rush was on for young and old down here. It began in 1851. The next 40 years, between 1852 and 1891, guess where Australia sat on the global income ladder for 40 years? It sat on the very top. It was number one outright for 28 of those 40 years, and for another nine of those 12 years, sorry, another 11 of those 12 years that it wasn't number one, it was second. There was one blip there where it dropped down to fourth for only a year. Now, if we're sitting on the top of the global income ladder for 40 years uh, through the 19th century, to the, pretty much to the depression of the 1890s, then you'd have to think that history is telling us that this boom that we're in now is probably not a bad one. It might have a few more years to run. The reason why I'm confident it'll probably run for a little longer, uh, how long I can't tell you yet because I want to retain my optimism and I don't want to fall into the trap of making a prediction for the next six weeks, six months or six years or even five years, the, mo the most recent mining boom, not the one that China motivated, but the one that Japan motivated for us. I can't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> You've mesmerised yourself you and us. You may close. I thought I was being slow. I thought I was being slow. <laughs> Look, I actually feel sorry for that guy, right? <laughs> Optimistic George was just rattling off some numbers and I'll let him finish before I tear him apart. <laughs> Now, the last mining boom we had went through the 60s into the 70s. And guess what? Through that period, not dissimilar to the period we're living through now, unemployment in Australia was consistently lower than it was in the UK and the US. That's the final thought. There's so much more I was going to say in that four minutes, but I've blown it. Now, let me tell you something, because I actually know this guy's method. I actually know... <laughs> I've got a fair bit of respect for his number crunching, but I've seen him on telly. <laughs> Just between you and me, his manner annoys me. <laughs> He's a calculated optimist who never really gets off the fence. Trust me, I know how these risk-averse journalists work. They are worse than politicians. Now, in economics, there's a saying, if you torture data long enough, it will confess to anything. <laughs> 
Now this optimistic scenario you've just heard relies on the repetition of history, a 40 year boom from the 19th century and a 15, 20 year boom from the 60s into the 70s. In the 80s, in the, in the 19th century and in the 60s and 70s, we were relying on things which were pretty, um, looking back, were pretty random, not pretty random, but pretty reliable, but a random event started them. Discovery of gold, it turned out we had 40 years worth of gold there. The reconstruction from the Second World War, a good 20 years in that. Relying on China, a communist country, which by its own admission has problems of corruption, inequality, urban congestion, and pollution, for anyone who's been there, it actually hits you in the face on some of the low smog alert days. Forget the high ones, because you can't even get out at that point. They are, more or less, the most volatile introduction into the global economic order we've had. And we are riding their coattails. And the difficulty we've got, and I heard optimistic George talk about the times in our past when we've kicked clear of the US and the UK, mother, and the great immigrant nation that we always look over our shoulder to. Guess what's happened in the last couple of years? For the first time ever, for any piece of data I can find, unemployment rate in the UK, unemployment rate in the US is falling, unemployment rate in Australia is rising. And that, unfortunately, is the price of separation from the first world and hooking onto the coattails of China. Now, the other thing, and every time you look at the economy and you think, what's going to happen in the political sphere in the next five years. Those 23 years, let's break down the 23 years of uninterrupted growth. Five of those are the Keating government, 11 years of the Howard government, and the last seven have been this thing I call the Rudd-Gillard-Abbott era. <laughs> Do you reckon there's been much reinvestment that's occurred in the last seven years that might secure the future for this country? Now, if he had a chance to finish his speech, he would have said, <laughs> The economy is going so well, it's even survived seven years of Rudd, Gillard and Abbott. We are home and hosed if, we've, if we're still growing after seven years of that. But the pessimist must insist that even though our government doesn't run an economy to the extent that it once did, without a reinvestment in the future, we are toast. And the reason why we're toast is that we're relying on a very, very volatile edition of the global economy, which up until now has been a force for good, for growth, but which, as they admit themselves, they're actually struggling to maintain uh, a semblance of balance. When the, crash com when the crash comes in China, we know what's written on our uh, tombstone. The moment ended at that point. And the reason why the moment ended in that point, and it tends to end not in the day that the deep recession comes, but you look back into the past and you think, what's gone wrong in the last five or 10 years? Well, I leave you with this thought, that the, one third of our longest uninterrupted period of growth has been, pardon the French, pissed up against the wall by this thing called the Rudd-Gillard-Abbott era. Now, the pessimist in me tells me that the churn is going to continue in politics. We're not going to be clear of this particular brand of leadership by 2020. And at that point, whatever China does to us is going to bring us down, I'm sorry to say. Sorry, George. <laughs> Well, I think George has learned a valuable lesson tonight, and that is that his optimistic self can borrow time from his pessimistic <laughs> self, and it all works out fine in the end. Ladies and gentlemen, our fourth speaker is the current Secretary for the Tasmanian Department of Justice. Although the trained observers among you will have spotted that he was once the Chief Commissioner of Victoria Police from 2009 to 2011. He's grown a beard, but he's still the same guy. Uh, Simon Overland is credited with a prominent role in bringing an end to the Melbourne gangland murders and associated crime in Victoria, and has demonstrated a strong commitment to social justice throughout his career. Speaking both optimistically and pessimistically for Australia's relationship to justice, over the next five years. Please welcome Simon Overland. Thank you, Annabelle. So, the ideal of justice, however you might actually define that concept, is central to the Australian identity. We see ourselves as a just people, placing a high value on justice and just outcomes. 
As a liberal democracy, our system of government provides mechanisms that facilitate the continual recalibration of the ideal of justice by balancing individual rights with collective needs. Executive government, parliament and the judiciary are the critical state institutions entrusted to ensure that balance. This process is ongoing and it's frequently messy, controversial and difficult as the choices involved require fine judgments and there are strong competing views on how best to proceed. The major challenges in front of Australia over the next five years are both global and local in manifestation and will require sophisticated responses at both levels if they are to be addressed. Nation states must play their part, but increasingly international institutions, laws and new ways and levels of cooperation are required if there is to be an effective response. Our system of government is well placed to respond to these challenges when and if they do manifest and we can be optimistic about our future. Let me elaborate by looking at the threat posed by terrorism, a current and future challenge. The threat of terrorism operates at two levels, physical and psychological. The physical threat, while violent, shocking and abhorrent, is not a threat in itself to the existence of the nation state. The physical threat is designed to drive a disproportionate psychological reaction of extreme fear, and in doing so, create a response that risks being disproportionate and an overreaction that delegitimises the state from within. Guantanamo Bay might be an example of that. The ology, events and past injustices that drives today's terrorists are global. The acts of today's terrorists, with one recent exception, have been committed overseas, yet the psychological reaction here in Australia is very real. The greatest threat to Australia of physical terrorism comes from within, because the terrorist doesn't have to travel from overseas as he's already here. He is the alienated, angry young man who is attracted by an ideology with global reach and influenced by a significant other who may actually live overseas to a point where he is radicalised and prepared to strike. So an effective response must be both global and local and consist of balanced and proportional measures that provide physical and psychological protection of all. Australia's contribution to events playing out across the world today and our so far measured and considered domestic response are cause for optimism. The role of IS in Syria and Iraq has required a coordinated multinational response, a response that has united Western and Middle Eastern countries, something not easily achieved in the past. There are other examples of the importance of measured international responses. The coming together of Europe's leaders and the mass gatherings across Europe to denounce the recent attacks in Paris illustrate new ways of demonstrating solidarity and a shared and common humanity in the face of inhumanity and brutality. In Australia, we're considering new surveillance laws to assist security and police agencies to counter terrorism. Whether these new powers come into law will be determined after careful consideration in our parliament where the wide range of views on these proposed laws will be aired and considered. Our executive and parliament are well placed to address the latest manifestation of the ongoing dialectic between collective need and human rights. And our court system is independent, mature and capable of reining in legislat legislative excess. In Australia, we're also alive to the dangers of disproportionate and targeted laws that potentially fan the flames of injustice that fire those amongst us who may be vulnerable to radicalisation. We have a long history of multiculturalism, a strength and something that we can be proud of. This approach has served us in the, well in the past and will continue to serve us well in effectively responding to counter radicalisation. Our systems of government have worked well to date and they show promising signs of adapting to meet the requirements of greater internationalism combined with balanced, measured and considered domestic responses to challenges we will confront over the next five years. We can go forward with optimism because uh, as a nation state, we will continue to rise to these challenges and play our part at home and abroad in, just, in addressing these challenges of our time. <laughs> Who is this guy kidding? <laughs> <laughs> it's all going beautifully, he'd have you believe. The international community can hold hands and sing Kumbaya and skip off into the sunset having defeated the scourges of our time. Believe that line and see me after, because boy, have I got a deal for you. <laughs> I agree that the challenges confronting Australia over the next five years will require new levels of international cooperation, but this is not achievable. Staying with the example of terrorism, while it is true that there is currently an international air warfare campaign directed against IS in Syria and Iraq that appears to be having some success, there is no evidence of a clear strategic agenda. 
beyond bombing IS into the ground. Force alone cannot and will not work. The rise of IS has in large part been fuelled by injustices of the past, including the use of force by the West and its allies against Muslim people and nations. A much more sophisticated and nuanced response is required, combining hard and soft power directed to identified and shared strategic ends. This does not appear to be the case at the moment. For example, what happens after the bombing campaign? IS may be defeated as a conventional military force, but surely it will simply morph into the terrorist networks from which it arose and which are so difficult to counter or defeat militarily. What happens next? Let's have a closer look at the European response to the recent terrorist acts in Paris. Sure, there were gatherings in support, but in the recent past, there have also been significant gatherings of right-wing groups across Europe protesting at the impact of immigration. In France, if there were a presidential election today, the far right-wing party, the National Front, would win the first round runoff. In Germany, right-wing anti-immigration parties are rising. Growing concerns about the impact of migration and increasing calls for and support of a retreat to national isolationism are threatening the internal order of many nation states and responses with force or with new and more draconian laws are simply making the problems worse. What about other known and likely challenges over the next five years? They are equally cause for pessimism. A real threat to safety and security is that of pandemic. How well placed are we to respond as a country and international community? Not well, based on that to the recent Ebola outbreak in West Africa. The international response was too slow and the means of transmission of this disease prevented it from being a far more significant problem internationally. It is only a matter of time before the world experiences a pandemic that combines high lethality with highly effective transmission and millions will die. On the basis of recent experience, the international response will be too slow. Let's also consider what has been described as the greatest moral challenge of our time, global warming and its impact. Here too is a problem that can only be solved through international cooperation, the likes of which the world has not previously seen, coupled with preparedness to take tough domestic decisions. Now, do we need to solve global warming in the next five years? The answer would seem to be no, but equally it would seem to be a good idea if we could at least make some significant progress. We are seeing the effects of global warming here in Australia and our region in the form of more extreme weather and frequent and larger natural disasters. They pose a real and present risk to the safety of many. Effective solutions to global warming will necessarily involve trade-offs against current rights. For example, are we in the West prepared to see our current living standards reduced in order to meet greenhouse gas reduction targets? What is the appropriate balance of responsibility for greenhouse gas reduction between a first world country like Australia and our near neighbour and emerging economy in Indonesia? There are profound, complex and incredibly difficult questions in effectively responding to global warming. There is very limited uh, progress in finding the international mechanisms that will necessary uh, to reach agreements that will achieve the required outcomes. Each and every country must contribute that this will require political skill and leadership of the highest orders. Feeling optimistic? And remember, a pessimist is just an optimist in possession of all the facts. <laughs> I'm very, very frightened. Thank you very much, Simon Overland. Our fifth and final speaker for tonight uh, is Eva Cox. Born Eva Hauser in Vienna, Eva grew up a refugee in England and arrived in Australia in 1948. A sociologist and celebrated, unabashed feminist, she is currently a professional fellow of the Centre for Policy Development and a research fellow at Jambana Indigenous House of Learning at UTS. She was recently honoured by being picked for a postage stamp as an Australian legend which means that she has been licked by hundreds of thousands of Australians. <laughs> to present first optimistic and then pessimistic thoughts on Australia's gender relations over the next five years, please welcome Eva Cox. I'm not going to talk about gender relationships because even though I'm a feminist, that's not what I really think we need to talk about today. I 
want to talk about us. I want to talk about all of you sitting here in the audience. I want to talk about what we can do about some of the things we've been hearing about and how feminism informs what I want to do and how I think we need to do it. So my optimism stuff is to say, basically, optimism is about our capacity to change things. I'm an optimist. I keep banging my head against brick walls. But as I used to tell my students, if you're going to bang your head against brick walls, work out where the loose bricks are. So that's my motto for tonight. What we've got to do is identify the loose bricks and blow down this bloody mess that people are making of things so that we can fix it. That's optimism. <laughs> I want to start by saying I'm delighted with Greg's speech because he actually put all of the objectives in I'd like to put in and so therefore I don't have to talk about the objectives. I just have to talk about how we get there, which might be a bit more difficult. I think we need to start talking about it, and this is where I want to sort of come in with the feminist stuff, by saying we can change the world. We did. I'm a 70s feminist. I'm the oldest person on this panel. And as you got a little bit of my background history, I've been around for a long time and I've seen what happens to political movements when they stuff up. And what I want to do is try and make sure we don't stuff this one up again, that we don't stuff up the world in the way that we did in the 1930s, because there's signals and signs around, which I'll get to when I get to the optimism thing, about trying to sort of change what's going on at the moment. We, did, we changed a world that was really had gone through the war, had gone through the sort of post-war period, and that period from the 1960s, 70s, 80s, into the 80s was actually extraordinarily optimistic. There was a very good doco that was, was on the ABC, I don't know whether any of you saw it, saw it some time ago, on the Black Theatre movement in Redfern. And it actually showed how Aboriginal people got together and made a hell of a lot of changes. It had a lesson for us all including the feminists and other things, because we did believe in the 70s that we could make changes, and we did. Everything, there's a lot of things about Australia which annoy me at the moment, but one of the things we have to say is the situation, the gender situation has improved, but it improved in the 60s and 70s, it's continued to improve in the 80s, and basically it has been stuck since then partly that we've had a few women in top positions, but you notice there's nearly always only one of them. Though maybe in Queensland, we might actually have two elected female premiers, depending on what's happening at the moment. So, you know, the glass ceiling has barely been scratched. But my view of feminism is not about the advancement of women. I hate to say this, because you cannot advance women in the current structure. What we need to look for is a society where issues of gender, and this is what we tried to do in the 70s, and people forget about that. We didn't want to compete with men on their terms. We wanted to change the terminology, change the values, change what was seen as important, and put the social clearly back on the agenda, because social is about connections and, th and various other things. And I just want everybody to think about the possibility that we actually live in a society and not an economy, parche George. It's hard to be optimistic when somebody tells us that the last 23 years have been fantastic, we've had this boom. The last 23 years have seen us getting into a sort of neoliberal mess, driven by a particular form of, uh, of, of a discipline, a social science discipline, which is just as fallible as the sociology one that I'm actually qualified in, but it doesn't think it is because it actually works with figures. It's actually worse than sociology because anything that it can't deal with, like emotions, relationships, values, etc., it labels externalities and ignores them all. <laughs> <laughs> my, my qualifications for this are excellent. I failed economics one at Sydney University many years ago, but it did mean that I came in and started questioning it. Look, I'm not saying economics is a complete thing like that, but I'm, all I'm saying is it has actually put a blight on us because so much policy now is about gross domestic product and I put the emphasis on gross. <laughs> and it certainly isn't domestic because it never goes near the bloody household. <laughs> But I think we need to sort of get back to the fact that we do live in a society. What is important to us is our relationships, who we are, how we relate to other people. That's why I'm excited by some of the things that Greg was saying, because the sort of society, and I do a lot of work these days around Indigenous issues as well as feminist issues, 
It, they are societies built on the fact that we're interconnected human beings. And they start from an optimistic assumption, and I'll finish off on this thing, is that human beings are basically good people. We're not self-interested dead shits, which happens to be the basis of most economic theory. <laughs> So now, having deeply insulted all of the people that, uh, that uh, sort of running the country, I'd like to sort of pick up on some of the sort of political issues that are happening at the moment as illustrations of why we have to be pessimistic at the moment or why pessimism is reigning at the moment. Pessimism reigns when people decide it's all too hard to fix. And I think for a lot of people, they're dipping out of the political scene. If you take a look at what's happening, and I've been trying to write this up, if you take a look at what happened in Victoria, then you take a look at what happened in Queensland or what's happening in Queensland, then you take a look at this absolute idiocy that's happening in Canberra, you realise that voters are actually crapped off with the current governments because both sides of politics are equally unaware of what people really want from politicians, which is some values, some vision and some ideas, and they're getting bored shitless telling them they've got to worry about the deficit. <laughs> I'm sure deficits are terribly important, but I'm sure they're also dead boring and they actually don't do very much for anything there. Yes, we're materially better off than we were 30 to 40 years ago. Emotionally, socially, I don't think we are. We're actually becoming nastier. We're nastier to poor people. We're becoming more unequal. There's more sense of not belonging. There's more sense of being outsiders. If you, take, if you add into what we were looking at in Australia, you add in what's happened in Greece and what's happened in Spain, where you've got left-wing groups that are quite likely possibly to take over government, but then add in what's happening in the UK with UKIP, add in what's happening in France with the National Front, add in what's happening in other parts of Europe and a bit of my own history as a sort of Jewish refugee starts coming through, because that was the 1930s. That's when the populist movements, when people lost faith in the democratic process, it allowed our dictatorships to rise. And that's what scares the shit out of me at the moment, is people are sufficiently disengaged from politics. It comes up, particularly young people, who really can't tell the difference between the two major parties, and some older ones have similar difficulties from time to time, that we actually have to get to the point where we start putting on the agenda something which gives people some sense that it is worth trying to get engaged into politics. So actually, there's 800 odd of you in this room, and I don't know what how the particular survey, I used to teach survey analysis, but I don't know whether the 300 is actually a good sample of what you were actually thinking. But if you are genuinely 75% of you are optimists, let's try and talk about how we can actually engage you so that we get out of the pessimistic thing where you decide you're either going to put your head under the doona or go and tend to the, to the gardens because it's much too hard to get involved in things political. It is hard getting in things political because very few of the people that call themselves progressive and probably given this audience a lot of you would label these things like that are doing more than bloody whinging about what's going wrong in the world. We've got to get off our bottoms and start doing something about finding the alternatives to policy and that's not just talking about process and proceduralism. It's talking about what sort of society do we want to be, what do we want to do about people who are on the outside, how can we stop banging on that the only thing that's worthwhile in life is get a job, get a job, get a job and we're going to punish people who don't contribute economically because social contributions are not counted. My version of feminism is that we actually have to get back to looking at how we contribute to a society collectively. And that's where my pessimism is, wor the pessimism worries me because what we've got in, ne in neoliberal economics is this idea that we are all individuals with choices and that we are not correlated to each other. Now, the only thing I can work out that actually uh, fits that particular mo model of the self-interested individual is actually the corporation because that's written usually into the Corporations Act that they've got to actually make profits on behalf of their shareholders most of us as human beings do care about other people, but we've got to be very careful that if we don't get sufficiently scared, and this is where the pessimism comes in, frightened of what the consequences are, angry with the politicians who keep banging on boringly about the deficit until we all go berserk, and then, then, then we are likely to have the situation that the world is going to really be grim, but it's up to us, you, me, and everybody else to get off our asses and do something.
No show without punch, ladies and gentlemen. That's why we put Eva last. Um, I should uh, report from my bird's eye view that uh, that optimistic Eva spoke with notes. Pessimistic Eva just let it all hang out. <laughs> she didn't need a note. <laughs> Now, we've raised a lot of issues here this evening. We've come to a, a few provisional conclusions about our future uh, as a society. Either we are a connected, powerful, humane group of non-self-interested dead shits, skipping nonetheless through towards our fourth decade of growth, full of intergenerational understanding where we respond rationally, rationally and proportionately to threat and still manage to ach achieve the occasional drone-delivered teabag. Either it's that, <laughs> either it's that or we live in a racist, consumerist hellscape cursed by rising unemployment, detached from the US and careering madly towards a China-sponsored crash led by idiots, riddled by pandemics, mindlessly bombing Syria, creating generations of enthusiastic new terrorists, whining endlessly while failing to raise a single finger to change things and still no robots to get us drinks. <laughs> <laughs> I am exhilarated and I am also incredibly angry and frightened right now. So I'm going to just turn a few questions over to our panel. Now, these questions have rather carefully and thoughtfully been uh, submitted uh, by organised people. Um, this one is from Helen in Thornbury. They're addressed particularly to whichever part of the personality is relevant. Helen um, in Thornbury wants to know from pessimistic George. George... We've had four changes of Prime Ministers in the last five years. Do you think this pattern will continue? Uh, yes. <laughs> Although yes is, a, yes is a positive. <laughs> can, can, can positive George answer this? There is a, there is a method to the uh, so-called electoral madness at the moment. Uh, I have been talking about this for a few years. The prediction was made many years ago that we would continue to flip from one side of politics to the other until they tune back into our wavelength. I, that's the electorate's view of how the country ought to run. And the fact that we're going through this churn now is, is not a sign of volatility. Volatility is the wrong word. I see the word get used a bit, but maybe this is from the benefit of not having to file a column every day, which I did in my former life. I probably would have fallen for the word like everybody else has fallen for it. It's not what happening at all. These are quite rational decisions voters are making. Uh, to knock off governments after a single term and to put a Prime Minister who sailed into power on three word slogans on a death watch at what, 16 months? Tony Abbott has been Prime Minister for what, 16 months? Mm. He won't actually get to Robert, uh, Robert Menzies, I was about to say, he won't get to Billy McMahon's length of service at the rate he's going. He would have been <laughs> Prime Minister for a shorter period than Billy McMahon. He's got about four or so months to catch him, and I don't think he's got four months. So how does a perceptive politician, a leader who does get it, break out of that cycle? Well, the problem, the problem both sides of politics have, and this is, a, this is a problem that doesn't get resolved by the current class. I don't think, I mean, there are dream scenarios that involve Malcolm Turnbull actually being Prime Minister of both a Liberal government and then a Labor government. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't rule it out, could you? You couldn't rule it out, but... You know the Labor people were thinking in that uh, in that Gillard in that Gillard Rudd thing, that soap opera. They were actually thinking of offering the prime ministership to Turnbull. It was mentioned around the traps, and everybody <laughs> laughed at the idea. But uh, Billy Hughes did it. <laughs> well, Billy Hughes, yes. But somebody would have to form a third party, and I don't think the system could probably handle that shock. Both sides of politics, and the media has done this as well, uh, view the difficulty with communicating with a diverse electorate. Uh, as follows. They think, well, I can't get to 50 plus one, which means building a coalition of interest in the community. I'll just yell on behalf of those people I'm most familiar with. So, you know, all newspapers for anyone over 60, uh, you know, in a household that are still willing to divide the, the paper between the news and the features and the sport. Um, in politics, basically, like-minded people who want to join political parties like you, which is next to nobody. Now, how do you fix this? 
you actually look at the you actually look at what the electorate is telling you, and it says, "I don't want ideology. I actually want you to build a coalition." Now, a coalition in the electorate is going to require a completely different form of thinking, and it may well be that the true system shock we still haven't lived through yet is a permanent uh, third party or independents that, that decide the government for the next few years, and that might straighten things out. Simon Overland, I'm... Oh, so all an right. answer, but... Eva has been frowning, and it's, I think it's something more than the fact that she thinks deficits are boring. <laughs> I think she's actively disagreeing with you. I've got a question for Simon in a second, but let's... Eva, I know you want to let something out. Well, I just think that, you know, the assumption there is that, you know, somehow or other we've got to sort of do things there. And, I mean, one of the points that I think that's really missing from the things at the moment, which I was trying to say, is because the two parties, there's this sort of scramble for the middle ground, even if the middle keeps moving over, that what people need if we want to stop changing government is actually a genuine choice between parties with a vision thing. And that's what's lacking because they all rush out and do bad focus groups and think that they found the solution. And it is that sort of, you know, that Tweedledum and Tweedle even dumber that once I think it was Janine Haynes described the two major parties as, that actually are boring the voters. And if you actually want them to leave somebody there, you've got to do the vision thing. And that's what's actually missing at the moment from politics. And I just think it was missing from what George was trying to say, that it's not about reading the electorate, it's about actually having an image of where we're trying to go that captive, captures people's imagination and then they'll vote them in and keep them there for a while until they get there. Simon, you talked a little bit about um, trade-offs against current rights. It often strikes me that that is what the heart of advocacy and politics is about, talking people into sacrificing something now in the interest of achieving a, um, a better thing sometime in the, in the middle distance. I'm going to ask both optimistic and pessimistic, Simon, about whether you think that it's still possible to do that. Well, it's been the great strength of our system of democracy. I mean, it is that constant dialectic between the uh, protection and benefit of all uh, and, you know, proper respect for human rights. Um, I am both optimistic and pessimistic about it. I mean, I think there are great strengths in our system, but the trouble is we keep mucking around with it. And, um, you know, I think in some ways, um, I mean, Greg's point's interesting, but I, I am a bit of a traditional Westminster government kind of guy because I think those institutions have served us well and I think we move away from them at our peril. But what's happened is there's no sort of meaningful debate about these things. I think that, um, you know, fear can be traded on and can be misused um, to drive any number of outcomes. And I think you would see that in this country at the moment. You'd probably see that in other countries at the moment. But I also think that democracy has tended to self-correct over time. That's the great strength. I mean, it's the balance of powers and it's the fact that we get to kick them out every three or four years. And so whilst it swings, it does tend to swing back. So I'm still hopeful about that. Where I'm less hopeful is that the system of government that has served us well in the past will not serve us well in the future in dealing with some of the issues that we've got to confront. Um, they require global solutions. And we haven't yet built the institutional mechanisms that will allow us to deliver on those things. So, you know, how on earth do we solve global warming? Because that involves really, really tough choices. It does involve first world countries saying, you know what, the growth model doesn't work. The growth model that's driven years of economic improvement and, you know, to our betterment doesn't work going forward. So what is the new model? And we can't have that debate here in Australia and I think we're struggling to have it internationally and we don't yet have the mechanisms to actually take it forward. OK, Greg, so um, uh, I don't know which Simon that was, but whichever... It's confused Simon. Confused Simon. was really not too taken with your, um, your newfangled, swanky new way of doing things. Can you defend your system? <laughs> Look, what I would say about that is that I don't have a problem with democracy. It has served us well, um, if you happen to be of a certain demographic. Um, <laughs> But um, we don't have democracy in Australia now. We have capitalist oligarchy, meaning we have the corporations controlling government rather than the other way around. So I think that, yes, you're right, we, just, we do need to tweak the current system, but by God, it needs a lot, it needs a lot of tweaks. Um, yeah. 
So, I mean, I'm not saying throw the baby out with the bathwater. What I am saying is envisioning the type of society we want to be, and I, we haven't had that conversation for a long time. What I'm really interested in hearing is um, Eva's vision for the future. Well, I think we just need to have what I keep calling at least, what I, I mean, I did the 1995 Boyer Lectures and talked about a truly civil society. I've given up on that. I just like one that's a bit more civil. <laughs> 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 I just think we need to sort of develop the sort of society where we respect differences, where we share things, where we talk collectively. I mean, I went to, and I mean, this is more New South Wales comment, but a lot, I think Victorians would relate to it, to Tom Uren's funeral. Uh, service last week, we talked about the fact that, you know, he saw the world as the strong helping the weak, that, that we collectively took responsibility for other people, that we were not there just to sort of build our own, feather our own nests and try and survive, but we were part of a society where we owed to others a level of care, which goes back to some of the things that Greg's talking about. That's the sort of society I want, and it scares the shit out of me that we're going to let, let robots do all of the sort of human relations. <laughs> Right, Marita, there is a question uh, from Catherine in Carlton that we had come in who wants to know from optimistic Marita, where do you think young people draw inspiration from in modern leadership? You're not allowed to say robots. <laughs> I think young people draw inspiration from everything around them. So it's from the media, from books, from television, and I think that's why it's important that we have young people read many, many books and read many newspapers and get a global view of the world so that they um, are exposed to lots of new ideas and can let their imaginations thrive rather than uh, just sitting in front of the television and being fed whatever the media decides to feed them that day. Do you find anything attractive or engaging about our democratic system at present since it's under discussion? Um, oh, I'm not very political. Well, I, I don't know. I don't try to get involved in that publicly. Um, <laughs> Um, well, I'm not asking you to comment on any particular players. I wonder if you feel part of that discussion or whether you tune out and look elsewhere for inspiration. George was talking about this huge slide in engagement from younger people in organised politics. Is that your experience too? Oh, definitely. Um, I mean, you just, you just have to look at the numbers. Um, young people aren't getting out there. They're not voting. They're not engaged. Um, when I was on Q&A in September and I, I thought a lot about what I wanted my message to be before I appeared on the show and, and, every, and every path led to, yeah, we need a vision for the future. We need the government to invest in science. We need the government to invest in technology so that we're creating a future for future generations. We need, um, we need yeah, we need to have a vision. We need to have a vision as a country to, to work towards rather than just playing stupid games um, and just trying to, you know, get a few more letters after your name so that you can have a better retirement fund. Um, that's not inspiring to young people. That's not inspiring to anyone. Um, and, you know, I, I would love for there to be a discussion about national vision, um, about what we as a country want to create going forward, something that's... Something that's that really calls to everyone in this country. Um, and, you know, if we could do that somehow, then, you know, I would love to get involved and I would love to see, you know, people like the people on this panel involved um, in, in having a say in, in what we want this country to look like. Okay, Eva will be taking your number after this. Um, <laughs> optimistic Greg, you have a question that's come in from Kathy in queue. She says, in 2020, by which time a sizeable group of young adults will have spent their formative years interacting with and through electronic devices, how do you imagine domestic and workplace relationships compared to the year 2000? You can answer that later too if you want, Marita. Yeah. Um, I might answer that by responding a little bit to what Marita said earlier. I think one of the key points she made was that... Um, you wanted more mentorship and you wanted to engage with elders. And I think that speaks very much to what we need as a society is we have so much information. We're in the information age. We have the internet. We have all of the technology. What we have forgotten to teach the next generations is context and values and how to have a conversation. Um, the institutions we used to hold dear, such as the church, um, 
you know, the military, um, government itself, um, those, you know, schools, those sorts of things have all fallen from grace one way or another. And so society is confused. We are confused about values now. Um, young people, I think, would have a much, um, while I, I know that a lot of young people are, are rightly optimistic, there's a, there's a tougher time um, than even my generation, I think, to, um, to think of a pathway forward. But I think what we need to do is recreate, use the same principles of, you know, in the old days they used to have dead balls and they used to have ceremonies and initiation ceremonies in our culture and, and in certain other religions and traditions. We need to take those same principles and recreate them for the modern world because what young people are crying out more for more than anything and what I think actually most of society is crying out for more than anything is connection and meaning. Um, and we can't do that with technology alone. It can help it, but we do need to create the place where we connect and have context as well. So what do those new structures look like, do you think? Well, I think outdoor education is a very simple one. I think um, every young person should have the opportunity to go bush for three months, whether that's a part of school or, or however that's done, I don't care. Um, that's a very simple thing that we can do. Um, I think young women need to spend more time with older women. I think young men need to spend more time with older men. Um, we do have some things to build on. I mean, sports is not all, I mean, I love sports, right? Um, but I don't like the kind of sports that recreates um, violence against women, for example, or an alcohol and drug culture. I think we can use sports. Um, a, a guy that I worked with before, Brian, um, what's his last name, McCoy, um, did a really interesting piece of research with Aboriginal communities um, up near, um, in the Kimberley, southern Kimberley. And what they found was that the young men, um, they have a tradition in that particular culture, Walpuri, about um, holding, they call it holding, where older men and older people would hold the young people, meaning emotionally and spiritually look after them. And where the old ceremonies were starting to fall away and alcohol and drugs and all the other distractions were coming in, football, AFL, became the way that holding could continue through another form. So we need to recreate these things for all of our young people. Schoolies Week is not a good initiation. That, that is, it is a national disgrace. I mean, I know all young people want to try grog and drugs and that's fine, but... It really is, I think, a sad indictment on our country if that's what we think, mm. if that's what young people think adulthood is, is getting drunk and plastered. That's not good. Marita, that was terrific, by the way. <laughs> Marita, what do those structures look like to you? What are you drawn to? What do you think young people will be drawn to in years to come? Uh, well, just in reply to the, the question that you asked before, um, I actually see my robots as a way of connecting people more um, because, um, I mean, the first, the first iteration of the robot that we're building is called a telepresence robot. And what it is is basically like a video phone on wheels, remotely controlled. So basically you could have one in your house and then your son or daughter or grandchild can Skype into that phone and then remotely manoeuvre that robot around to find you in your house and then spend some time with you. And that means that... <laughs> and, and their face will be on the screen so you get to see them and you'll be able to hear, what, you'll be able to hear their jokes and just spend time with them physically in the, in the garden or in the kitchen. And I see that as connecting people because rather than spending an hour to go to your house and then spend time with you and then an hour to go back, they can just you know, spend an hour with you and they don't need to take another two hours out of their day in order to do that. And that means that they can see you more often. <laughs> Coming back on relationship so, commutes. Yeah, <laughs> but, but I think that's an important point because we, we as a society tend to have these binary thinkings that it's got to be one or the other, mm -hmm. that it's either or, and, and you're absolutely right, it doesn't have to be that. We can have the best of both, I think. You know... And, um, I mean, you have these at, re at hospitals, so for special moments, um, like, you know, baby or, um, I, don't, I don't know, other things that happen at a hospital. Um, broken leg, broken leg. <laughs> broken leg, yeah. So people can, like, um, hire one of these telepresence robots and go up to that person's um, bed and, and, you know, spend that 
milestone with them or, or just spend time with, with someone. I mean, if, if I was in a hospital and, and someone actually took the time to hire a robot and come up to me and say hi, because they were on the other side of the world or in another city and they couldn't, they couldn't get to me easily, then, you know, I, I think that, that would make me feel really special and I'd be able to see their face and talk to them. Um, and, and even all the things that I was mentioning with the robot arm, uh, the reason why I see that as being a possibility in the next five years is because it won't be the robot cooking meals and getting drinks through artificial intelligence. It will be the robot controlled by someone somewhere else in the world to do those tasks. So basically that telepresence robot, that video screen on wheels where someone remotely can maneuver it around, you, you put a robot arm on that and you have someone remotely control that robot arm. It's, it's not just, it's not just elect, electrons and, and electronics that, that are making this robot move. It's someone somewhere else on the other side of the world that's, that's caring for you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have covered an enormous amount of territory here tonight. I think this has been a very efficient use of 90 minutes. Um, we, from building the human infrastructures and institutions of the future to say it with cyborgs, we have explored an outrageous uh, degree of possibility. I, it's horrible, but we, we are nearly out of time, and so I'm going to do something brutally unfair to the panel and ask them each to say whether after everything they've heard, they feel on balance, optimistic or pessimistic. I'm gonna start with you, Eva. Well, I'm obviously optimistic because I keep trying to change the world. So I'm just gonna keep at it and bugger the bastards. We'll get them eventually. <laughs> There's a lot to be said for still showing up, isn't there? Yeah. Simon, no Simon Overland, thumbs oh, up or thumbs down? I'm an optimist, but uh, optimistic about the next five years. Beyond that, I'm less sure. <laughs> Hedging his bets. <laughs> George Megalogenis. Uh, I remain glass half full, and uh, I don't think I'll ever stop the war on whinging. Uh, but the next five years are actually a lot trickier than they seem. But uh, long-term Australia is probably about the only country that's equipped to survive in the 21st century. There's a number of reasons we didn't, didn't get to go into any of it, but I'm actually quite confident in the long run. All right, that's three zip at this stage. Marita? I'm an optimist. I think that, um, I think that sometimes like society, the media, it, it makes it really hard in, in that kind of environment to, to be positive about everything, to be positive about the future as a country politically. Um, and it's only when I do panels like this that I get to really think deeply about, you know, what, what should be done and what could be done. And, um, and yeah, every time I, I do think about it, it does come down to let's, you know, there's, there's people who, who have brains, who have intelligence, like Eva here, um, <laughs> who, you know, who, who want to create a better Australia. And, and it just feels like there's no platform for them to do it. Um, and so that's what I'm really interested in as, as like an action from this. Like how, how can we create a platform such that people can contribute and create a, a vision that's, that's sensible and inspiring and something that we can work towards? And I'm an optimist, so we're gonna make that happen. Good on how? you. How about you, Greg? Care to make it a clean, clean sweep? Um, I think that things in some ways will get worse um, through, <laughs> through but, but what I would say is that in sickness and in chaos, there is always opportunity. And in fact, I don't think the transformation can happen without that. So while things may get worse for a while, I think we should not welcome it, but we should work with it and see our way through it, hold the course and don't give up five minutes before the miracle. <laughs> You know what, um, the, on a shallow note, Greg, Five Minutes Before the Miracle is an amazing book title and I would like you to write a book of that name. <laughs> right. Okay, well, if you, if you write the introduction, I will. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that is probably an op optimistic undertaking on both our parts, but I think uh, in honour of everyone here, we will work towards it together. Um, 
That's a pretty good balance, I think. And um, can I say personally, I have been thrilled, encouraged and inspired, as well as mildly ter terrified by uh, some of what's been said tonight, but I have no point been bored. Thank you so much to our uh, wonderful panel. You're, we're not finished with you yet, of course, um, because you've sat through it all. And I'm interested in knowing whether that 75, 25 margin is holding up. Now, we're not going to go to all the trouble and expense of polling you again, because the Australian Electoral Commission is not available and would not necessarily, yeah, anyway. Uh, so I'm just going to take an old fashioned approach and uh, yell, ask you to yell very loudly when I ask <laughs> you a question in a moment, either yay, or nay? No, actually, I'm going to ask you one by one. Do you feel optimistic about Australia's future to 2020? If you do feel optimistic, yell yay now. Yay! yay. And if you feel pessimistic, then you may loudly yell boo. boo. <laughs> oh. mm, well, I think it's pretty close. <laughs> I think we've slightly depressed you. I reckon that was more than... <laughs> but either, the, either the pessimists have just got louder voices, which is a problem in itself. Look, Division. street brawl outside, now! <laughs> Look. Well, you know, we're, gonna, we're, we're just going to have to move through this together, I suspect. Um, one thing I suspect we can all agree on is um, that our speakers have been fabulous this evening. So please, Eva Cox... Simon Overland. George Megalogenis. Marita Chang. And Greg Phillips.